Hi, Jim Bennett, and welcome to another ZTEC Talk. We're going to be talking about integrity management. And welcome to the top of the Craigie on the south side of Glasgow, as we can see the little reservoir in the background behind us. And we will be talking about integrity within transportation systems as well. As many of you know, I work within the, the major accident hazards area. And integrity management there is all about keeping fluids and gases within process systems within pipework, within vessels. But these principles apply to all walks of life, to our homes. It's all about the services coming in. That, as we can see here, is about water coming in, electricity, gas to our homes. All require certain levels of integrity, integrity management. It applies to our communities, our road systems, our supermarkets our education, our schools, our libraries, our hospitals, transportation. We, it's the same classic again. It's road, the air and sea all have certain levels of integrity management. And also, if we go up into the, the, the NASA, into the airspace, we all have integrity management. So I'll be exploring some of these principles with you. Integrity management, a major change in the sector I work, or have worked particularly within, is the North Sea of Scotland. There was a, a tragedy, the Piper Alpha tragedy, in 1988, where 167 souls lost their lives. There was a step change in safety, particularly integrity management. And I believe something similar will occur post the Grenfell Inquiry, the Grenfell Tower Block fire down in London. For me, this was foreseeable. Something sim similar had happened across in Dubai nearly 18 months, two years previously. Rapid spread of flame in the outer surface of the building. From a, a North Sea perspective, the step change was changing the legislative framework. From a compliance one to goal setting, risk management one. I believe something similar will happen onshore post Grenfell. It, it's, it's terrible that tragedies like this have got to occur for step change. What I'd like to do is share some of the principles I've been working to for over 20 years. My integrity management experience is from a global basis, from the Arctic Circle above Norway to the Middle East, Africa, India, and a background of mountaineering. Some of these principles include major accident hazards identification, something called the bow tie principle, safety critical elements, safety critical equipment. A key component of integrity management is about the culture, the framework that we're living and working within. And for me, core to that is what I call ethical leadership. What's our core values? What's our beliefs? What's the supporting behaviours to ensure we have high levels of integrity management and we keep risks as low as reasonably practical? From an integrated business management system we balance income and expenditure. This is underpinned by our HSE management system and particularly a process safety management and integrity management framework. Our objective is not to harm anyone, not to damage the environment and have a good percentage return on our capital expenditure. And we talk about a flawless operation. This is underpinned by cultural maturity based on our core values and behaviours. I'll discuss more of that later. Risk management is a key component of integrity management where we endeavour to keep risks as low as reasonably practicable. The key steps as we can see on the left hand side 
hazard, hazard identification, with elimination strategies underpinned by systems and standards. It's important to have a good hazard understanding. The key components of that is what is the cause? What will the severity be? What's the potential severity and the hazard effect or consequence and potential escalation paths? Elimination is about inherent safety, minimising its source whenever possible. And type of strategies that we can discuss and look at are prevention, control, mitigation, and if all that fails, evacuation. Type of systems that we have are passive systems, and that would look like uh, cladding or fire cladding on steamwork, for example. Uh, active systems could be deluge, uh, sprinkler systems, operations, control of work, permit to work systems, and external systems that help us underpinned, as we've said before, about our in-house standards, our industry standards, and the legislative framework that we work within. The framework we use for major accident hazard management comprises of the diagram we see here. Core to this is something called the safety case, which is underpinned by our health, safety, environmental management systems. We have our maintenance management systems, management of change, and of course, a core component of this is integrity management. From an operational risk assessment perspective, the guidance issued by the Oil and Gas UK is a superb example that's worthy of reading. This is an example of Major Action Hazard Science Risk Assessment Methodology and the principles can be applied to many other sectors. We start off this process by hazard identification, looking at the operations hazard. What's the purpose that your uh, process is involved in and the operational hazard, particularly looking at energy sources. And that could be uh, hydrocarbons under pressure, electricity. Then we look at external hazards. Have we anything that can impact for example, contractors coming on site, uh, lifting over vessels or part of your plant or area. Natural hazards, storms, the various things that can happen there, flooding coming in. And then human error hazards. We look at unintentional and intentional uh, errors. And anything else, it's the, the other, it's the what if, so what questions that we're looking for here. Scenario development. How big can it be? The consequence uh, analysis, likelihood, how often can it be? Then we get to another tool set, risk analysis, and I'll give you an overview of that in a moment. Look at anything else that can impact us, develop risk reduction measures, bringing risk to the, the ALAP region, that as low as reasonably practicable, and then if there's anything left over, we look at residual risk management. This is an example of risk assessment methodologies. This is normally the field of specialists. However, if you happen to be involved in management teams, it's good to have a working knowledge of what these tools mean to your operation. We have, as we can see here, hazard evaluation, frequency assessment, consequence assessment, and risk analysis tool sets. From a hazard evaluation, it's what if checklist, hazard or hazard and operability studies, fault tree analysis under frequency assessment methods. We have fault and event tree analysis. We have quantified risk assessment or QRA, consequence, event tree analysis. We see here fire and explosion modeling, mitigation models, how we reduce it to, as we said, an acceptable level. Risk analysis methods, a risk matrix, risk profiling. We have FN curves for managing societal risk. And as you can see, we have the risk isopleth, which is a graph showing the occurrence or frequency of a phenomenon as a function of two variables. 
for more information on this, is one way of looking at Lee's process safety essentials. Integrity management is about reducing risks. Reducing risks to a broadly acceptable region. This is where the inverted triangle comes into and the alert as low as reasonably practical principle comes in. At the top end, as we can see here, it's intolerable. Risk can't be justified. The bottom, the broadly acceptable region, it's necessary to maintain insurance that risk remains at, level, at this level. That's where we've got our safety critical elements, our safety critical equipment comes in. And the bit in the middle, the alert region, is tolerable. Only if risk reduction is impractical or it's disproportionate for the improved game. High reliability organisations have a culture, a culture of continuous improvement, where any system or plant upset becomes a learning opportunity, an opportunity to enhance the quality, quality and methodology of working. And a classic model is a plan do check act. So we consolidate, move on, improve, consolidate, move on and improve. And within the high risk organisations, we have something called the cheese model. For some reason, Swiss cheese model is a barrier model. It's about hazards and events. Left hand side with hazards or energy sources. We're trying to prevent events, things happening. Hazard, for example, can be hydrocarbons under pressure. The event is release of hydrocarbons under pressure, could be fire or explosion. So what we're trying to do, particularly with integrity management, is to prevent holes in the barriers. As we can see, prevention, detection, control, mitigation and rescue and recovery. And this forms a key component or the principles, a key component of what's called the Bowtie model that many major accident hazard sites are using. So let's go and explain that in some more depth now. The Bowtie model is a graphical representation of how we keep risks at an acceptable level. It's part of our integrated business management system and feeding into it, as you can see here, our HSEQ, health, safety, environmental and quality management systems. The guiding principles can be applied, as I mentioned previously, to many other sectors. In the centre, we have something called the top event, which I'll come to in a moment, feeding into that the hazard or energy sources. And on the left hand side, we have the various threats and escalation factors and the barriers that I mentioned previously. The Swiss cheese model from Jim Reason. Right hand side, we have the potential consequences and recovery barriers that I, I mentioned previously. We start off in the centre of the diagram with the hazard. This is something that has the potential to cause harm if control is lost. For example, driving a car, hydrocarbons in, cont in containment, or landing an aircraft. Go below that to the top event, and this happens before major damage has occurred and it may be possible to recover from it. An example of that could be losing control over a car, loss of hydrocarbon containment, deviation from an intended flight path. And the threats, as we can see in the left hand side here, are credible causes for the top event. Example, driving on a slippery road, Pipeline corrosion, directly linking into integrity management, loss of positional awareness. Going far right, these are the hazardous outcomes arising from our top event. For example, car rollover, ignition of a vapour cloud, or a mid-air collision. And if we look at the potential escalation factors, these these are factors that reduce the effectiveness of a barrier. For example, 
forgetting to wear a seat belt, no maintenance, particularly with integrity management, and persons are not trained. So the barriers that we're looking at mentioning here, for example, they prevent, control, or reduce the undesired event or accidents. For example, wearing a seatbelt. Um, for drilling, this could be a blowout preventer. Or for aircraft, a, a ground proximity warning systems. So, as I say, summarising, looking at uh, preventive barriers, eliminates the threat or prevents the top event, the part in the centre, recovery barrier avoids or reduces the consequence. An escalation factor barrier reduces the effects of the escalation factor. Integrity management assurance and verification has a role, a role of ensuring that our various barriers, as we've seen in the bowtie model, are kept effective and we have appropriate performance factors for them. So we have our insurance, our verification processes, and as I mentioned previously, it's a lot about culture. Culture of workforce, managers, and independent bodies to ensure that risks are reduced and maintained at an acceptable level. We do this by keeping risks to an acceptable level through safety critical elements and safety critical equipment. We have a, a plant in the middle of our diagram here carrying out a process of photosynthesis and it has a potential hazard of being poisoned and we have a number of barriers in place. That can be elimination, prevention, detection, control, mitigation, rescue and recovery. So the key elements of the plant comprise of the flower, stem, leaves and root system. And if we consider this from an integrity management perspective, we're looking at the equipment. And the equipment could be for the flower, petal, stamen and pollen. And from the stem, we've got the, node, the internode and epidermis, leaves, the vein, the, the, the midrib and the blade coming from that. We go down on to the root system, primary, lateral and hairs. And we hold this with assurance, with safety and verification. We get assurance through performance standards. Performance standards for our safety critical equipment of functionality, availability, reliability, survivability and its interactions with any related equipment. Functionality. This is about what the safety equipment must do. For example, if it's an isolation valve, will it close in demand? Availability. Will it, will it be ready to perform? What is its availability rate? Is it 99, 99% available. Reliability. Will it perform its function? An isolation valve. What's its leakage rate? Will it leak at all? Survivability. Will it be available and capable performing, say for example, a fire and explosions? And its interactions. What is its dependency on related equipment to make sure the performance standard is maintained? Let's get down to the root of things with a worked example, looking at safety critical elements and their sub-elements. What we're endeavouring to do is eliminate fire and explosion and looking far to the right to rest and recover from structural collapse and sinking. At safety critical element level, we have, for example, the plant layout. At sub-element level, we have process containment, ignition prevention, them to shut down the structure. Likewise, we're through for fire and gas detection and we can see the various elements there for them to shut down the alarm and public address right through to our safety boat. The process of identifying our safety critical elements comes from 
our initial hazard identification assessment, major accident scenarios, the various hazards that we're exposed to, and we can get data sets from major accident register as well. Look at primary hazards, fire explosion, and depending on your sector, in this particular one, there's transportation, helicopter, ships. We look at uh, potential for structural failure, anything dropped objects, working with cranes, and uh, looking at, in this particular case, um, oil and gas wells, well blowouts, safety critical um, elements coming from that, Involve process containment, ignition control, as we can read through. For example, ignition control, EX equipment, electrical equipment, EXI, EXD, um, earthing and bonding of our equipment. Right through to wellhead, the casing and blowout preventers. Depending, as I say, on your respective sector, what would be considered your safety critical elements and sub-elements. Please check out the link below for more details and further examples. Once identified, we look at the effectiveness to give us our assurance on the effectiveness of our key performance indicators. So we're looking at prevention barriers, mitigation and recovery barriers. So we, we have the capability under each element to determine the effectiveness of the various equipment, the sub-elements of the equipment they are within, individually and cumulatively. How effective? Are we maintaining risks to an acceptable level? If not, what do we need to do about it? What's, what's, what leadership, what management actions are required? Please see the link below to Asset Integrity. This practitioner's Assurance and Verification Guide, which expands further on the principles that I've described so far. My global travels, looking at integrity management, I find that ultimately the effectiveness in the delivery of integrity management systems is based on the cultural maturity of an organisation. Less mature organisations there's a great dependency on procedures and procedures. And it tends to be if there's any incidents, it's more about immediate cause. Let's have a new procedure. Or from time to time, I've seen a blame culture. As an organisation becomes more mature, it becomes proactive, leading and lagging indicators, greater levels of competency, dynamic risk assessments, and if there's any problem, it's an opportunity, a learning opportunity to enhance and improve the way that the organisation is working. It's the continuous learning cycle. This is a culture of high reliability organisations. And high reliability organisations work to what one would, one would call a just culture. For more information on just culture, please see this book and the link below. High reliability organisations are proactive. They carry out horizon scans, looking, seeing above, around and below anything that can impact the organisation. Particularly as we live in what some would call a VUCA world. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world. So how do we manage that? How do we control that? By having a clear vision, understanding integrity management. Where are we heading? What's our purpose? How do we maintain integrity? Have an understanding of the hazards that impacts our organisation. Have clarity, roles, responsibilities and systems. And from time to time, if the mist comes rolling in, we have the agility to respond, to be able to have dynamic risk assessment and be able to continue to deliver operational excellence. Now to summarise. As we can see, the weather has picked up a lot warmer than it was up the top of the hill. Integrity management, what's it all about? It's about knowing and understanding hazards and risks and keeping risks as low 
as reasonably practicable. In doing so, we keep ourselves, we keep our communities, our organisations stronger, smarter and safer. Until the next time, most certainly a warm goodbye.